and welcome to the debut podcast of Jackie's Giant Music Show, where I'm going to be talking with original songwriters and the individuals that support them in the music industry. The program tonight is sponsored by HearItThere.com and its founder, Elisa Zuckerberg. For this first podcast, I'm thrilled to have Evan Balzer, a Hudson Valley songwriter and instrumentalist. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Evan. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. So if I call you by the wrong name, please forgive me. <laughs> and do. Um, we'll just keep on going and pretend like I didn't do that. So before we get too far into it, and I always want to make sure we cover this topic, tell me where we can find you and your music on social media. It's um, available everywhere where music is sold. How's that sound? It sounds like the old um, <laughs> the old TV <laughs> and radio ads. Uh, CDs are available at cdbaby.com as well as amazon.com. And uh, for streaming, just about everywhere. You can get it at Apple Music, iTunes, um, Spotify, Rhapsody, which I understand is now Napster, um, as well as iHeartRadio and I think a couple, and Google Play too for our Android friends. Oh, really? So- Tell me about the other social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, and mm -hmm. those kind of things. Are you on all of those as well? Yes. Um, it's really essential for marketing uh, music in this day and age, as well as marketing oneself as a, as a performer. Um, Facebook, uh, from a business standpoint, has so many advertising tools that one can use to uh, to promote their music and get people out to shows and build um, followers and, and lists of fans and promote music, um, linking, Instagram. You, you, it syncs up with just about any other social. They all sync together. Mm -hmm. uh, having you know, been around as long as I have and, and remembering a time when we didn't have things such as digital recording technology, as well as social media, it really is, it's indispensable for an independent artist to have these tools at their disposal to promote themselves. What about, are you a tweeter? I don't tweet as much. No? I, th I think there's enough tweeting going on in the world <laughs> these days. Well, yeah, and we'll leave that, it at that. that. That, you know, it's funny because I feel like Twitter is almost dying and maybe it's me but um and it's not because of who's doing it i just thought that it was going away and it seems like funny that it's so controversial now. well and with social media too i think as a musician you have to be conscious of who your audience is and my audience um are men and women 45 years of age and older because my music is essentially classic rock with a, you know, a, a twist, as I say, a twist of funk and blues in it. Um, but younger audiences, um, kids in their 20s, you know, Facebook is not nearly as prevalent from a usage standpoint as Snapchat, let's say, or, um, or, or um, Instagram. I do have some background in marketing. Oh, do you? <laughs> yes. Where did you go to school? Um, I went to actually Dutchess Community College is an alma mater and um, Pace University. But I'll di give a shout out to my Dutchess Community College friends because they come out to a lot of my um, shows in Poughkeepsie. And um, it's always good to see them. So it's there you Reminisce old war stories. <laughs> there you are, demographic. Uh, uh, yeah. So what about music? Did you study music in school? Or I did not. I did not. I started um, in the fourth grade, my first exposure. Well, first of all, I have to go back. My mother um, was a really gifted soprano and she would always be singing. And um, she uh, she sang in church as well. Um, she was hired out to, unfortunately, to funerals, but also weddings where she, where she, she would sing. And um, so always exposed to music within the household and then through public school music programs, which back when I was growing up, you know, every child had an instrument of their choice put into their hands. And my first instrument was a, um, a trumpet, which I played for one year. And eventually the next year, I, it, it was a journey. I found clarinet. And then I played saxophone for maybe um, three or four years. And... But now, unfortunately, I couldn't play a note if you asked me. And then I, I really didn't start playing guitar until I was about 15, 16 years old. You must have read my mind. I was going to ask if you still played the sax because that kind of sounds like it would be part of your 
the music that you're playing now. I, I, I think, you know, I don't know, hopefully it's something innate within me from a melodic sensibility. But I, I, I what I do know for sure is having been exposed to those different instruments, which I don't believe is the case anymore in public schools, but having been exposed to all those instruments, it gave me a real appreciation for tone and how difficult it is to get a tone on a saxophone and, and particularly a trumpet for that matter. Um, and then, so bringing that appreciation into guitar changed everything. But when I was playing horns, I wasn't exposed at the time yet to Led Zeppelin, no. <laughs> or, which really changed everything. Which blew your mind. It did. <laughs> going away from guitar or going away from the, uh, the brass into the, to the, um, guitar. How did you start to get into the guitar then? Was that from when you heard the rock music or? Um, yes. Yeah. So my first. For the first, I used to have an, a paper route back when people actually read newspapers and, and boys such as myself on their bicycle deliver newspapers. I had a paper route and I used to spend all of my money going down to the record shop to get um, albums at the time when people listened to albums still. Um, and the first album I bought was Edgar Winter, They Only Come Out at Night, that had a pretty interesting cover. And I, I'll, I'll never forget my mother's reaction when I brought it home. And, and she and I go, look, Mom, Edgar Winter, They Only Come Out at Night. And her response was, thank God. <laughs> 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 and that had some great music on it. Ronnie Montrose was the guitar player. And the, fr the song Frankenstein at the time really caught okay. my attention. So, but I still, that didn't get me to actually pick up the instrument. And then... Hearing the fourth Led Zeppelin album um, on my parents' old tube stereo cranked um, kind of really changed my life. But then, then I saw on ABC back in the early 70s, they used to have a show called In Concert that used to be on Friday nights. And I saw the, uh, they had the original California Jam. And Deep Purple was a headliner on that jam. And I saw Richie Blackmore play Burn and they were doing their Burn album at the time. And I just saw that on television. I was like, I, I, I have to learn how to play guitar. I really want to do that. And that was, so that was the catalyst to it. So let's talk a little bit about the lyrics. So you have two CDs out now, right? Yes. Um, Colors That Move was your first. Yes. And then that was an, a completely instrumental yes. CD. And now your second CD, the one that we're going to talk about uh, seconds. Yes. Is is not instrumental? Mm -hmm. Is that am I right so far? You are absolutely correct. How am I correct. doing? Um, so, how did you, why did you change, or what kind of drove you to go from one to the other? Um, so the first record was uh, Colors That Move. It was just pretty much to prove to my first. It was to prove myself that I could get back to playing guitar because I took a long time off um, to raise children and and get married and all that kind of stuff. And I, you know, through some personal changes in my life, I found that I had some time on my hands and I wanted to really get back to playing guitar and get back to playing it in a serious way, much like I did um, in my younger years. So what better way to get back into it than declare, well, I'm going to make an album, which was you know, <laughs> at the time probably a pretty bold thing. Um, but I had a I had a kind of a sonic vision in my head what I wanted to achieve, and it was specifically sonic. It, it didn't involve any kind of lyrical content or anything like that. And I always loved Jeff Beck, Blow by Blow, and I loved the sound of Led Zeppelin, The Presence album. I, I, I think sonically the guitars on Led Zeppelin Presence were probably, many would argue against me, but I think that was probably the high moment, especially something like Achilles' Last Stand. And to marry the two of them into some kind of instrumental um, album. So I went back into doing it and I had a lot of um, help in... Um, support from my, my old friend, a drummer friend, Paul Ferenc, um, who we worked together on this. He's, he's, I'm, he actually has co-writing credit on a lot of the ideas and we went in, we bashed stuff out and we recorded it. And so that it, it, personally, it felt like an, it felt like an achievement. Wow. I was, a, I was able to do this and it came out meeting my expectations. Now for this album, you know, I believe any artist does not want to become stale. And if I were to come out and do another instrumental album, I think for my own listening and for others, I, I don't want it. I don't want to be repetitive. And it's kind of, I think as an artist, I think it's kind of fun 
to throw curveballs at people. So I don't think anybody was, ex- I, I, ke- I kept it under wraps for a long period of time. The guys in my current band, um, John Clay and Gary Brokaw, they didn't e- even hear the um, CD until I actually had the CDs in, in my hand. They did not play on the um, on the CD. I'll talk about who did later, I'm sure. But I wanted to approach lyrics because I didn't want to th- people to think I was just all about doing a guitar album because a huge influence on me um, was Pete Townsend um, and Richard Thompson and a lot of artists that really um, had something to say lyrically. Pete Townsend, um, All the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes and Richard Thompson, Shoot Out the Lights and um, Rumor and Sire, are particular favorites of mine. So I, I, I thought, you know what? I can do a guitar album, but what if I really tried to focus on lyrics and singing for the first time? Um, and so that's, that's the direct, that's, that's why the evolution was of, um, lyrics, but also the approach to creating this album was different from the last album. The last album was a lot about riffs, guitar riffs and, um, drum grooves. Whereas this one was starting from, well, what would this sound like as a song and starting from it, you know, from a song standpoint. So you wrote all the lyrics? Yes. In a week? No. <laughs> <laughs> that no. was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um so when when you sang, were you surprised that you could sing or did you Well, I started singing after the first album came out. Um the I wanted to pl- have it played out live and so I had to actually put together uh, a, a band to play it. And in order to get into certain venues, you can't just jump out and start playing, at least ar- around the Hudson Valley, just jump out and start playing or, you know, original instrumental, instrumental guitar music because right. you will never be asked back. So I had to incorporate other um, material into my repertoire, and that required singing. And But because I wanted to keep it down into kind of a, a, a sparse um, lineup, a trio lineup of guitar, bass, and drums, I decided, you know what, I'm going to try and sing for the first time. So I sang, started singing live for the first time. And then after, when I went into doing the album, the thought was, well, I would probably bring somebody in. But then I thought, you know, doing a project like an album being an artist, you you have to always challenge yourself. And I, at the time I thought, you know, there probably isn't any bigger challenge than singing on a record. So that's how I got to that point. Oh. And in listening to it, I was like, well, and, um, and my, my friend, uh, Paul Schlichting, um, an old drummer friend of mine whom I, with whom I'll be doing some, um, new projects coming up shortly. I said to him, if Bob Dylan can do it, <laughs> you know, I can. Because a lot, the truth be told, a lot of some of the best music ever recorded isn't always sung by the most trained vocalists. I did want to just kind of review how we came to meet each other. Now, I remember hearing about you through a friend of mine that does the sound at Rascal Flats, which is no longer open, Correct. right? Yeah. I think Dave Rabins. Dave Rabins. Now, is that the first time I heard of you or? De- well, yeah, I think so because Dave was doing the sound at Rascal Flats at the time that we were doing some shows down there. Yeah. And he actually, when we, we were setting up for the, for the show, he came, Oh, you know, you know, Jackie? I go, yeah, I know Jackie. And then he goes, well, I know, I, I know her too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I feel the same way about him because yeah. he does he does some really exciting stuff. Do you see? He just did something with with um, Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. He was right. really excited about that. Yeah, and, that the Eagle, and the Eagles as well. And he's a really really talented guy. I mean, he's, who Alice Cooper or no, Dave, Dave Ravens. Ravens? Yeah. Does he play instrument as well? I don't know if he does. I just know that he does great live sound. Talking about uh, stepping off. Where are we talking about stepping off? <laughs> um, what do you say we listen to a song off of the album? Oh, that'd be great. Help. What What do you think we should uh, listen to when next? We, uh, a step from the fire. Oh, because I said step. Yeah. All right. Step from the fire. That sounds good. What we learn 
Chad is a fool who does not yearn Takes the taut in tiny ways Riddle and clue beyond the name Trodden paths should lead to light Bit as the rule of what those spy Change the change of simple fate Stand in your line and tremble to stay What we hear, keep out of sight of that we fear. Ties that break, how bonds we share. A passing fancy, an ego shred. Fly that trade, the platinum cost. Those are the scenes of what's been lost. Stations of pain, we reap what's sown. Seeking to crack all the hearts now stone. One step away from the fire. from the fire led me into thinking it was about one thing but then when I listened to the chorus I kind of went a little in a different way and I'm curious what were you thinking well I'm not really sure how to express it first I want to make sure I have the wording right one step away from the The fire. fire two steps you'll never get burned three steps you learn how to fold your hand 
and never retrace what's not learned. So that third step takes me in a different direction. I thought it was about a relationship that was bad. Nope. The fire. Is, mm-hmm. is it about a relationship? Not necessarily. It's about not resisting temptation, not getting too close to things that you've learned you should not get close to. <laughs> So not necessarily fi- a yeah, woman fi- or a no, person. No, no, no. You learn you learn lessons for life. You know, never retrace lessons not learned. Um, one step away from desire. How little we taste what we earn or yearn, depending on how you want to hear it. Uh, but no, it's not n- nothing. No, it's nothing about relationships. Which I, as a lyricist, I think at times you try to make things not so obvious. And it is not obvious because it can be interpreted right. however the person needs to be at yes. that moment. Yes, someone, you know, power of a song, someone can often interpret lyrics entirely in a personal way that it becomes something that is meaningful to themselves as opposed perhaps to what the artist intended it for, for it to mean. Do you get upset when somebody comes up and says to you, I figured out your song and it's completely different than what you... We're no, because that means they're it. actually listening to it. Oh, that is true. I never thought about it. I know an artist who, whenever I tell him, I, oh, this is what this song means. He says, no, you're completely wrong. It gets all huffy. And I'm, nah, and, anybody know. that takes the time to listen to my music, yeah. they can interpret it any way that they, that, that, that they want. I mean, there are certain things that Prob- may have personal meaning to me that were inspiration to the lyric. But mm-hmm. as a lyricist, you try to make it so that people can apply it to them themselves in their own situations in a way that they get something out of the song. So you, you say you are happy when people know the words and that they're listening. Do you have, have you gotten it to the situation where you're looking out to the audience and folks are singing along with you? Not yet, because these haven't been performed live yet. Oh, you had mentioned that. So yeah. you just released this CD, didn't you? October 2nd, yes. October 2nd, which was, what is it now? A week Today ago, to, a week ago to, to, tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, yeah. Today's and, Monday. Yeah. Well, we're recording on um, October 8th, Yes, is it? But um, God, people could be listening to this in December of Hopefully. 2020. But um, anyway, um, but still, the song will still be there and it'll have different meanings for different folks. And by 2020, I bet you will have folks singing along with you. Well, that would be an, an honor. <laughs> so... Let's talk a little bit about where you're playing uh, mm-hmm. coming up. You've got something coming up this weekend. You want to Saturday, tell us? I'm playing my regular um, monthly show at the Redline Roadhouse, which is in Cortland Manor, New York. My friend, it's my friend Jordan Gaylor's place and Patty Gaylor, and it, they've turned it into a roadhouse with excellent, excellent food. <laughs> I, I will say, and great. Um, live music. I mean, Jordan has um, live music three nights a week, sometimes four nights, but three nights a week. And I've often, he's a friend of mine and I've often said to him, you know, your, your place is a lot like the baked potato in Hollywood, which is a very famous jazz club oh, in, yeah? in Hollywood. Um, where all of the, the greats play locally, like um, Larry Carlton and Steve Lukather and everybody, they just hop in and sit there. So I'm playing there this Saturday night. Where is the Red Line Roadhouse? Um, it's it's in the area of Poughkeepsie. and No, excuse me. No, Isn't that's it, the next weekend. It's in the area Portland? of Peekskill. It's not far from the Annsville Circle along the um, Route 9. Is that... Is that right at the circle there? No, it's on the circle. You have to go up nine and then make the, the first right. I think the actual address oh. is Albany, Old Albany Post Road or something like Did that. You? But but if you go out to my um, Facebook page. Yes, back to the Facebook. Old, back, um, Evan Balzer Music, um, the address is on there on the events page. Oh, okay. I think I know where that is now. So you're there this Saturday. What time is this uh, music start? Actually, it, it it's good because it starts earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, it's it's an eight to eleven show, eight p.m. to eleven p.m. show. So that way, people can come and get dinner and have a night of music and not be out too late. 
So are you, because you're friendly with the owner, are you able to basically just play your original stuff or is he expecting I am, I am truly privileged that Jordan lets me play whatever, <laughs> whatever I want, which oh, is great nice. because I can go in there and not just Jordan, the, the, um, the people, um, there who, many who, of whom have become my friends, mm-hmm. they give, um, me and the, and the trio, um, the license to, to play whatever we want. And I should add, it's not just me. I have a, I have a great band behind me. I have John Clay on drums. Who's, um, actually done a lot of um, jazz work um, with Zoot Sims and some other players. And um, Gary Brokaw plays bass and also handles some of the vocals. And we take, we'll take songs. When we're not doing the originals, we'll take often classic rock songs and we'll extend them out. We become kind of a jam band. You never know where we're going to go. We take it off into these improvisational directions. And that audience seems to like that. Um, which is great as a musician because you get to experiment stuff. So often, very often, because I'm there every month, I will try new stuff there before taking it to other places. So are you primarily, it's a residence, I guess, that you have. Is it always the same, like the third Saturday or the first Um, Saturday? In the beginning it was. It was kind of like the third Saturday, but we're experimenting with like Fridays and and, really? and, 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 and Saturdays because they, they get, they get a good crowd there on Fridays as well. Oh, I wonder. And if especially you... this time of year is great because it's Oktoberfest and, and Jordan cooks amazing German food. Oh, is it? Oh yeah. I'll have to get over there yeah. and try that. Um, Wiener schnitzel. Or all of it. All of the schnitzels, bratwurst, um, bratwurst. The best of the Schwein, worst. Schwein, Schweinbraten and um, sauerbraten, oh, everything. Oh, yum. So is it, is it primarily German at the Red Line Road? No, just in October, just for October. Just for Oktoberfest. And do they, da- is there dancing there too? Or? There's room for dancing. Yeah, there people is? get up and they dance. People can do whatever they want. And it's a really, it's a cool, comfortable place. And because it's a restaurant, um, there really isn't an age restriction. Um, you, ah. know, um, you know, you can bring your kids and everything, which is always good. have dinner and yeah. starts at eight. Yep. Eight to eleven seems to be like a sophisticated time to go out and get home, and it's still not too late. It's it's a humane time. Humane, <laughs> yes, yes. I know some of these places in Peekskill they start at ten o'clock. At yeah, night that's and, tough. And they play till one or two in the morning, but so then the following the twentieth. That's a Saturday as well, I guess. That's up in Poughkeepsie, and we're playing up at um, Juan Murphy's. That's become kind of a regular gig for me as well. Um, is that a Mexican restaurant? It's a Mexican restaurant, Irish bar. Oh, look, Juan Murphy's. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't catch that. Yeah, and my friends Leah Morris and um, and Costas up there and um, Grellen, they, um, they have a really great place there that has a really cool vibe. And another place where you can go in and, and play... You know, we, we, we do a different set. We don't do the typical set that bar, that um, people would play. We bring in certainly a lot of classical rock, that classic rock that people recognize, but also we'll slip in something from Miles Davis ah. and, and do in our own way and, 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 and um, to, to keep the blues alive, which um, our friend Paul, <laughs> our, 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 our um, mutual friend Paul um, and I, we, we, we try to do, I will, we'll, we'll squeeze in maybe about five or six blues songs in, in a night too. And, and actually talk about the origins of them, where they're from. And we do them in our own way, which is kind of a power trio way, but um, some would say it's not you know, an authentic sound, but it, it, is, it is a power trio sound. And we, but we do it. We do. I, I, I really insist that we play some blues songs in these sets because it's, it's important music. I'm trying to think of who that famous, I'm, I'm sure I'm showing my lack of intelligence about uh, power trios, but there is a famous power trio and I can't come up with Cream. <laughs> yes, Cream. Um, do you, is, was cream a big influence of yours at one time? Or? Yeah, at one time, definitely. Um, the power trio format, a lot, cause a lot of the bands in the seventies had three instruments and a separate lead singer. Um, uh-huh. you know, Led Zeppelin had, had that format, although John Paul Jones, he, he was kind of the secret ingredient in that band, in my opinion, with, um, multi instruments and very, very, um, 
he's the unsung hero in that band. I mean, a lot of credit goes to Jimmy Page. You don't Page. really hear too much about him. Yeah. Well, yeah, he, um, I mean, he and Jimmy Page, they did all that session work in the sixties and, and John Paul Jones is a very big music arranger and film score writer. But if, if you really listen to those Led Zeppelin albums, you listen to the keyboards and a lot of the things that he did. Um, amazing musician. Another influence of yours, I think you mentioned earlier. Led Zeppelin, um, Led Zeppelin was, was certainly, um, but being a you know a, 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 a guitar player, I, I gravitated towards guitarists. Jeff Beck too. I mean, Jeff Beck is definitely way, way, way up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. As an influence, guitar influence. So I think the last show that I see you have coming up is. This Whistling Willies in Cold Spring. It's our debut there. November. <laughs> yes, the colder weather is approaching. Yeah. Although November it doesn't 3rd. seem so these days with you know no. the, the, the warmth we've had in the Hudson Valley and New York. Well, I think the, the seasons seem to be shifting. Like September is still summer. And even into mid-October, like here we are and it's yeah, usually warmer it, tomorrow. Usually it's crisp, but it's not crisp. That's okay. It'll yeah. get here. <laughs> So you say this is your debut at the at Whistling Willie's Cold Spring? Yep. How how did you get in there? Um, I saw some place where they were looking for new bands um, to bring in. And I said, hey. Here I am. <laughs> here, Yeah, here I am. And we play regularly in the area. So um, we'd be thrilled if you would have us in there as well. Well, I asked because it, it's hard to get a new band, especially an original band, uh, places to play in the county like you said it's you know they want to hear i mean the the cover bands seem to be so popular yes. but you know you want well that, which is why in the set that we we do inc we, we incorporate a lot of you know our job is to entertain people mm -hmm. and if they're not having a good time then we're not doing our job and 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 the venue where we're playing does not have a good night so we will go in there and, and my philosophy is, yes, I would like to play some of my original music, but in order to have the license to do that, I have to entertain you where you have fun with some other songs. So I have to have some songs in there where you want to feel like get up and, and dance. Um, I have to have some songs where you want to listen to some guitar playing and jamming. I also, throughout the night, have to have things that are recognizable to you being the person in the audience so that you connect to it. And then what we'll do is we'll weave in the originals. Um, we'll intersperse the originals throughout the set and we'll say something like, okay, by the way, we're going to just take you a little, on a little side a little side trip. trip. Yeah. Um, because you're right. It, it, it is, it is difficult. It, it's difficult to break into new places. It's difficult to, um, break in, um, especially with anything, um, that's original. And I'm, and I'm very thankful now. Um, we're not doing second, anything from seconds yet. We will be, but from colors that move, we have five selections now off that CD that we're playing live in each show. And these, that was the instrumental. That yes. Your first yes. CD. Um, so I really think that I want to make sure people know where to find you. Yes. Um, you said Evan balls or music. music. On Facebook. Yes. And then I have a website that mm -hmm. is That's e -V -A -N -B -A -L -Z -E -R com. That's E-V-A-N-B-A-L-Z-E-R.com. That's my website. Just evanbalzer.com. Yep. I got that URL. That, that was the smartest thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, it's always surprising. It's not Evan Balzer 517 or. No, you go out to evanbalzer.com right now. As a matter of fact, I was just updating it because I realized that I had nothing on there about my new CD. So. Oh yeah. That's a, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Well, when you're an independent music, when you're an independent musician, artist, you're your own manager. You're responsible for self-promotion. You have to know you have to be a marketer. You have to be a website designer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be a social media marketer. Um, you have to be an, an artist on top of that. So you have to wear many hats. And finding the time to do all that stuff yes. is not always easy. Yes, what, but it becomes, it, it's a passion, certainly. Well, so speaking of your music and your passion, why don't we listen to another song Um what do you think we're going to do? What would you like would us you like to play to, Let's um, Let's try Blindsided, which Blindsided? is, um, we can talk about what it's about perhaps after on the other side. Oh, okay. Let's see if my 
my thought, <laughs> what I think it means now, it just means somebody came at me that I wasn't expected and I fell in love with them and they took me away onto a, a Caribbean cruise. So maybe um, we'll find out if I'm right. <laughs> was I to well this album I will be honest I am middle aged well I, I come on <laughs> and, but this because um, as an artistic statement an artist reflects on what they know mm -hmm. um, lyrically this album is written from a middle aged perspective so blindsided is it's about when you are faced with um, a crossroads, no pun intended with this crossroads song, but you're faced at a crossroads in your life at which point essentially the rug is taken out from under you. And for those of us in middle age who have lived and have had to deal with a diff many different things in our life, when you have the um, rug pulled out from under you, you have to embark upon a new life. New direction. Yeah. So that's pretty much what it's about. Ah, okay. So it wasn't about love at all. It can be. What is the line that kind of is going to reveal that to me? That day the clouds break away from reach of hand, the sound that rain rains make beyond the shattered band. 
you know, so a shattered band could be um, a marriage, it could be a bond, but, um, you know, about tra empty trains. Um, it tries to get at, it tries to get at when you're at that crossroads in your life and the rug gets pulled out from under you. And essentially this isn't probably you just for middle-aged people. It's it, 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 it lost a job, um, a breakup of a re relationship, a death. You know, when we're in middle age, we deal a lot with death. And all of a sudden you're faced with, well, the next morning, that next morning after what happened and it's like, how do I carry on my life? You know, that day the clouds break away from reach of hand, uh, the sound that rains make. Um, so you interpret it like that. Um, and also for shooting towards things in your life, so you, got, you have to play the game in life. You get hurt, but if you don't play the game in life, you don't live. Yeah, you gotta. So have how's that for being there. evasive? And <laughs> and no, it's good. So I'm just gonna. Um, well, obviously, I was wrong in my. Um, no, you, no, no. You need now. You're not wrong because remember what I said earlier. For the list, the listener is always right, and I can't tell you how many songs I've heard in in the course of my life where just. From my own need, I needed to interpret certain yeah. words. Like you listen, you know, I brought up Pete Townsend. Um, All the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes was probably one of his most poorly received records of all time. Most poorly sold record. It had slit skirts, which came out um, as a um, single. But the lyrics on that, um, for me personally, resonated for me Um you know, just just in in titles such as "The Sea Refuses No River." I mean, that's that just that's just a huge line in and of itself. So I took those lyrics for my own situation. So when you you know you you can't say that you got it right or wrong because there's never anything right or wrong about music. It's all in the interpretation, much like any piece of art. You know, you go you walk into the Met. I mean, you look at the Impressionists or or or, or, the, or MoMA, and you look at some of that art, especially modern art. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's subject to your own interpretation. So that day, the clouds break. Yep. Away from reach, reach of, of hand. hand, it's like the the clouds are breaking. Something's happening in your life, but it's beyond the reach of hands, beyond the grasp of what you're able to control. I think I like the deeper, darker side of the song. Um, my uh, my point of view was always like, oh, la, 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 everything's happy. I'm in love and I'm playing, uh, you know, looking at unicorns and rainbows. But this has a deeper meaning than that. Yes. Um, yes. So, I mean, and it, it can, I guess, it can pull you out of... A, a sad situation if you, if you, well, what I, am I trying to say? Um, so the lyrics are, we'll call them, call it serious, if you will, but the beat, remember any music has to move you and not just lyrically it has to move you. So the beat is very Motown-ish. Yes, upbeat. not Caribbean at all. No, uh, upbeat, <laughs> it, up, it, it's, it it's is. upbeat. And, and what I tried to do with this song, you know, some things you have to do intentionally when you're make, when you're when you're doing songs and making an album. Um, as, apart from the instrumental album, I tried to keep some of the sh song lengths shorter. Um, so this is actually a short song. You know, it's it's a classic singles length song from mm -hmm. back. You know, in the sixties, the three minute song. Yeah. I, th I think this clocks in maybe three minutes or just over three minutes. But it's th it's it's an upbeat. Um, rhythm and sound, which there are many, many, many songs out there in recorded history that are upbeat um, songs that often have um, darker lyrical meanings and intentions. Yeah, foolery, trickery. Yeah. So let's go talk about a little bit about your release. Um, did you just release the whole album or are you doing a single? Like, like this song you say is a... Um, I'm trying to figure out what the single is, the first one. I'm almost thinking this is it. Yeah, I think so. Because um, in addition to yourself, uh, um, a couple of other friends, have it, it's resonated well with them. People who've heard the whole album and actually heard the whole album a couple of times. So I think it could, it, it could be this one. Although I have had a couple of people say that Step From The Fire mm -hmm. uh, resonated with them. 
I think for certain formats, those two songs are, have a different feel to them. Um, I think Step From The Fire actually has a, not intentionally, but it has a crossover um, feel. It has a kind of a country feel to it. I did spend um, some time back in the early 90s playing in a country band, and it had a, had a big impact on my guitar playing, so I kind of dip into that tool chest from time to time. It wasn't intentional, but it comes out as being kind of a, the whole album is kind of a style stew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The step from the fire, though, didn't you say that was kind of a long song? So it is a long song because there's a lot of lyrics to it. That it, that wasn't intended to be sing, a single, you know, classic three minute. But having heard some reaction of her for some people to the chorus, um, which I guess has kind of a, has, a, has a has a hooky feel to it, a memorable feel to it. It could have some kind of single potential, um, long song, you know, singles that have been successful. Have not always been um, like short. American Ask Don McLean. Yeah, <laughs> our our neighbor in um, over in Garrison. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, th- I believe he still lives there. But Is yeah. He- well, so we off air. We were talking a little bit about picking singles and songs, in that you were telling us about reverb and something that you reverb nation. Reverb yeah. nation. Um, tell me a little bit about that story. I want to understand that more. It's really interesting to me. <clears throat> so on the last album, Colors That Move, we had um, five, essentially five minutes to kind of fill for a 45, 40, 45 minute album. And um, the drummer, Paul Frank, I was doing a rehearsal one that when we were doing a rehearsal one night at his house and I was just playing Well, he, he had a step away and I was just noodling on guitar. He goes, you know, that would be really cool if you did something like on that, on the, on the record, kind of a lonely saxophone in an alley, you know, how that's the jazz saxophone will play alone in an alley. So it was kind of cool. So then, um, the engineer and co-producer Seth, um, Mintz, I told him just lay down some kind of a keyboard pad throw a drum machine to it and I'll just play a guitar solo over it and it'll be, it, it, you know, it, we'll, we'll fill up a few minutes of it with a, with this lonely guitar thing. So that became Jaded Raven. And what I did was I wanted to get feedback. And so Reverb Nation had this, they still do. They have a product called Crowd Reports where they take the song and they put it out to a, a, a blindly randomized audience, getting into research speak, <laughs> my marketing background, there you go. Um, a randomized audience where you, they put, and, and, and the people to listen to it, they don't know the artist, they just listen to it and they rate it and they're allowed to comment on it. Uh, and the report, and you get a report back, you get a market research report back with a rating on a scale of 10. How does your, how does this track rate on radio worthiness on a scale of 10? Well, this Jaded Raven came back as a 7.9 and anything over 7.2, the Reverb Nation will make you a featured artist for the month. I mean, for the, for a week. So this came back. I'm like, okay, here, I have an instrumental guitar album. One, two, (laughs) I have a throw in song that I just decided, okay, I'll throw it out and see what people think. And what was interesting, not just the score I got back, but the verbatim comments where the people actually write in what they thought, they were very enlightening. And it gave me a sense that, well, okay, some people said it has a Santana feel. It has a, it's a, I never thought this, but it has a cool blues guitar solo over a hip hop feel. I never, there was never any intention, not that there's anything wrong with it, but there was never any intention to have a, a hip hop anything on the record. But you know, in retrospect, looking back at it, it is kind of a blues guitar over a hip hop. So I, I was totally surprised. And it just goes to show you one, you never know what is going to resonate with people. And often the thing that you ha- think on an album has the, le- the least potential often turns things around. And that's happened over and over and over again over the history of music. Well, so just to continue a bit. So how did you Get they'll do anybody's uh, music. If as you're a Reverb reports? Nation member, mm-hmm. um, not to be a plug for Reverb Nation, but, no, if, you're, but- if you're if you're a member, you can upload your song um, for a minimal cost, and they'll throw it out, and they'll have anywhere from twenty five to fifty people rate it and comment on it in full verbiage, um, and and we were talking about this on on the break. 
you can't go into it with thin skin because for everyone that thinks that, oh, this is really great, you're going to get a couple of things, you know, they say, well, this is the worst garbage I've ever heard well, yeah. in my life. And, but you can't, but you have to, you're, you, you have to learn to kind of say, okay, I get that. Maybe this just wasn't for you, but there's just so much to be learned from what people can tell you. And so why I haven't figured out what a single will be at is I want to hear and listen to people such as yourself, what resonates with you and other mm -hmm. people um, in um, what they liked. And then that helps the decision process. What would be the first single to go? Well, Cause we're still what, early in the game. That's what I'm thinking that this reverberation crowd uh, reports could be for anyone that yes. has a CD that they're thinking about releasing or trying to figure out what their single is. Because Honestly, when you are promoting a new CD or a new album or even a new single, you want the feedback, you want the comments. Like this person that gave you that comment about the reggae, uh, the hip hop, hip hop. I'm stuck on that reggae. Um, <laughs> it's it's kind of like an interesting hook for you. You can, if you want to go and and put that on your Facebook page somewhere, you might oh, I have. hashtag that and get a whole new group of listeners. I, I, I have. I've taken those quotes and said, and, and make them into a quote bubble about certain things. Yeah. It becomes a great marketing tool. And in this day and age, you have to market yourself. You have yeah. to get over the hump. It, it's a difficult hump to get over to promote yourself, <laughs> but you have to do it because nobody else will. So, you know, if you're out there and you're, and you're releasing a record, I, I think I think you should try this and I agree too. And um that's enough of a commercial for reverberation. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but um I would like to listen to another song. Um and I think we have time for one more at least. And if we spend a few more minutes, if I wait for it, you'll tell me the name of the song. And the song is called Wait. Do do I even want to guess what this one is about? Or do I, I want to leave listen? I'll leave that up to you. We're having fun. Um, I, well, it seems to me that there's a somewhat of a theme in this album about growth yes. and changes in our life, experiences and things turning out not to be exactly what we were planning. Yes. So I guess if you wait long enough, you'll find out where you're going to end up. And having the courage to go to take the next step. Take the next step. You're pretty close on this one. Oh, cool. I might have you got win. it right after all this. <laughs> <laughs>
broken stars Treading the tides that drown one in old ways I do with my interpretation of weight? Pretty much spot on, on the third try. On the third try? Well, you know, after having spent the time talking with you and getting to know a little bit about you and um, the the vibe and the nature of the album, you know, I learned. There, there you go. There thank, you go. And thank you so much for listening. Ah, well, you know, I have been listening in the car for the past week. Yes, I still have a car that has a CD player in it. I my computer does not have a CD player, so the only place I listen is in the car. And um, I've been enjoying your music all week, and I have been enjoying this conversation. Thank you for the past hour, and I thank you so much for being my first guest. It was it was my honor and privilege, and thank you so much for having me You're and welcome. supporting my music. I want to bring you back uh, when we can do a live performance with you and the Power Trio. Oh, this would be a perfect place to do it, and to. Yeah, and and I and I want to send a special thank you to Adam Bernier, Yay, our Adam. engineer, who's been uh, guiding us along and keeping us on track. And I look forward to what the future brings for us. So everybody, thanks for tuning in to the premiere debut. How's that for two fancy words in one sentence? And uh, have a great week. The time when you try to pace that rhythm of your woes Not now you tell yourself don't give in to those devils and those robes Just tip the switch of the thread and stitch the time in our trail of lows Begin to know what we feel to be till we tell what we can show Take tumble dice, we roll